Okay, I'd like to thank Dr. Rosenberg for the invitation. And I really like to thank all the families, parents and families for actively participating. I've learned a lot about PANS, PANDAS in the last two days. I'm a basic scientist who's new to this field, so I really appreciate all the background. I'd like to talk about genetics. Um, I'll talk a little bit about um, what genetics can tell us for this disorder. Uh, I have to give a little bit of brief intro into the methods involved. Uh, we have a lot of time, so I'll, I'll just give it very briefly. I'd like to talk about some of the work I've done in schizophrenia. I think it's a really promising example of where we've taken a disorder that's very heterogeneous and been able to identify genes that regulate susceptibility that can uh, ideally tell us something uh, clinically useful uh, in, in a short time frame. We have a little bit of brief literature review on, on the genetics of pan pandas and talk about an ongoing genetic study. And I'll end with some very encouraging preliminary data where it looks like we um, are getting close to identifying uh, one potential locus involved in susceptibility to pan pandas. Uh, so what can genetics tell us? I think that um, the main thing is are pan's patients genetically predisposed to an autoimmune reaction? And second, if, if that's true, what genes are responsible and what can they tell us about the mechanism? Um, like Mike just said, we you know, have a lot of work to do to identify what is actually causing this on a molecular level. And without that information, it'll be hard to identify or develop new treatments. And ultimately, are there genetic variants that actually are predictive of successful treatment regimens to help inform um, you know, what treatment should be done? Um, so I'll talk a, a little bit about DNA sources. Again, I've been really, you know, happy with the enthusiasm from a lot of the families that are, are willing to uh, collaborate on this study. Um, there's a range of different uh, material that we can get DNA from. Uh, one of the simplest is saliva. We were talking about that last night with um, some of the families. It's also okay to get uh, buckle swabs, so cheek swabs, a good source of DNA as well. Just very briefly go over DNA variation in a general sense. So the human genome is a very big place, it's about three billion base pairs. Uh, and on a simple sense, the, you know, we all differ on, on some small variants, so like a single base level, where one person may have a C, a C and another person may have a T. Uh, we also differ on a structural level where there are regions of the genome that are either duplicated or deleted in certain people. And these can all lead to differential susceptibility to infections and, and response, perhaps like pans pandas. Um, there are a lot of different technologies now. There's been a great deal of development and reduced costs in actually getting a lot of genetic data. Uh, it used to be terribly expensive, but we can now interrogate the genome for around seventy to eighty dollars per sample uh, for common variation and. It's where you just extract the DNA and run it on uh, a microarray of this sort, which is basically a glass slide with a, a lot of uh, millions of probes on it. Also, the cost of DNA sequencing has really dropped. Uh, there have been a lot of technological advances, uh, and this is you know, to the point where you can detect all kinds of variation, whether it's a single base or perhaps an inversion of a chromosome or something more complicated. Um, and the cost for this has dropped, you know, uh, at a staggering rate where just, you know, 15 years ago it was about $100 million to sequence a genome. Uh, and this year we're doing it for all, nearly $1,000 per sample. So a really tremendous advance and things that just were not possible uh, even a few years ago are now possible. Uh, there are two basic techniques to identify uh, genes responsible for phenotypes. One of them is linkage. And in a simple sense, this is taking a family, an extended family that may have a, a history of uh, the phenotype of interest, and just collecting as many samples as possible, both from affected and unaffected, so healthy and uh, sick individuals, and just trying to make a connection between a DNA sequence or genotype and inheritance of a phenotype. Um, so it's often hard to find extended pedigrees that have, say, cousins or you know, multiple affecteds, but oh, I've already heard in this conference that there are families like that, that that are willing to participate, so that's great. There's a second method called uh, genome-wide association where you don't need large families. You can take, uh, say, unrelated individuals, um, ideally a large number of them, and look at the relationship between uh, cases and controls, just comparing healthy versus not, uh, and looking across the whole genome. This has been highly successful. This is what we've done for schizophrenia. 
and I'd like to um, just talk about that example real quickly. So in a simple sense, GWAS, genome-wide association studies are taking cases and controls and again interrogating the entire genome and trying to see where they're different. We'll just briefly go over schizophrenia as an example. Um, I need to introduce this uh, axis here. So the X axis is the genome. So this is chromosomes 1 to 22. Uh, and on the Y axis, what you're looking at are just regions across the chromosome, what the genetic association is with the phenotype. So the higher a, a dot goes, the more associated um, that particular region of this chromosome is with the phenotype. So what we found when we first did this called so-called genome scan of schizophrenia was that it's quite complicated. We had collected, you know, over 2,500 individuals with schizophrenia, uh, 3,000 controls, and there were not regions of the genome that passed this threshold of significance. Um, so it was actually no surprise to a lot of psychiatrists this is a very heterogeneous disorder, uh, and um, nonetheless we did identify some regions that were uh, marginally associated. Um, a few years later, the sample size grew, and we actually got genes uh, to pop over, to jump over this bar of significance. The first one to do so was actually the major histocompatibility region, which is very involved in the immune system, and actually fit a lot of hypotheses, a lot of epidemiological data that the immune system is very important in schizophrenia. And then we've just collected samples at an amazing rate, where we've actually up to over 35,000 samples now about 50,000 controls, and been able to identify many genes across the genome that are associated with schizophrenia. Um, and the most important thing is that they've had uh, let's see, insights into, you know, what's causing schizophrenia and, and how might we improve treatment. So amongst these genes that are associated are uh, the dopamine receptor D2, which is actually a direct target of antipsychotic drugs. You have genes that are involved in glutamate neurotransmission. There's a lot of development in the pharmaceutical industry on, on these pathways. <coughs> there are uh, genes involved in calcium transmission that are very associated, and there are a lot of existing drugs for, you know, calcium that could be used, uh, that are being, now being in trials for schizophrenia. So the bottom line is that, you know, this very complicated scan can tell us a lot about biology. talk about, so what do we know about the genetics of Pan's pandas? Um, went over this a little bit yesterday. There's basically encouraging signs from uh, other phenotypes that are uh, strep-induced. So acute rheumatic fever, we see evidence from twin studies that there's high heritability. There's actually higher her heritability than schizophrenia. Um, and further support so from some case studies from Tanya and others. And I've heard it mentioned here many times that Pan's pandas uh, subjects have a family history of autoimmune disorders. So we'll talk a bit in the last part about ongoing genetic study. Uh, the idea is to collect, again, as many DNA samples as possible. I, I don't think it will take as many as it has taken for schizophrenia. I think this is much more homogeneous. In, in general, autoimmune disorders have done very well on genetic studies. It hasn't taken nearly as many samples to identify. Uh, furthermore, it sounds like we have the potential to collect extended pedigrees. Uh, we're looking um, initially at the same region that popped up for schizophrenia and a lot of autoimmune disorders, HLA locus, but also um, we're now starting studies across the whole genome as well.